Hello everyone, welcome to this video where we will be talking about managing uncertainty in uh, supply chains uh, using safety inventories. Right. So uh, in the last uh, few weeks we've looked at uh, the idea of cycle inventory, uh, how we calculate cycle inventory in many uh, in different scenarios when you have a single product, when you have multiple product, what do you do when you get quantity discount. So we did all of that for cycle inventory. But um, so in all, in all of those calculations, we assumed that the demand is fixed. So if you remember when we did EOQ calculations, um, calculations when you had a production qu order quantity calculations, or even quantity discount calculations, we always assumed that annual demand was a known number. Now obviously, you never know exactly what demand is going to be for the next year, but maybe you forecasted a number and you're looking at a single number and you're working with a single number. But what if, um, I shouldn't say what if, we know that um, real life inventories are variable. So there is uncertainty in, in uh, demand. So if that's the case, how do you manage uncertainty in demand? And that that's what we're gonna be talking about today, right? So. A uh, few things that we're going to learn are the different levels of measures of product availability, which is very important because uh, when demand is uncertain, you will not be able to satisfy customer demand all the time. You might have enough inventory to satisfy customer demand, sometimes you might not. But the amount of inventory you hold in any given time period depends upon how, how available you want your product to be. So if you're okay with 60% availability, then you hold a certain amount of demand. If you want 99% availability, you hold a certain amount of demand. And what are the pros and cons of holding 60 versus 99? Well, we'll talk through that this week and uh, 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 the next week also, right? Okay, so we'll also talk about uh, what is safety inventory, the role of safety inventory in um, managing uncertainty in supply chains. Then we'll identify the factors that influence the level of safety inventory. And finally, we'll talk about some managerial levers that you can use to lower safety inventory without hurting product availability. Because usually safety inventory and product availability are opposing forces. If you have a lot of safety inventory, your product availability will be very, uh, sorry, uh, uh, I shouldn't say so, uh, uh, opposing forces. When you have a lot of safety inventory, your product availability is also high, but you're also, the holding cost is also high. You're holding a lot of inventory on hand, so you have a lot of your assets tied up. But is there, pos is there a possibility for us to lower safety inventory without actually hurting the product availability? What are the things that we can do to achieve that? And we'll, we'll talk about that uh, uh, later on uh, through, this, through this module, right? So uh, let's first begin with what, what is safety inventory in the first place? So safety inventory is uh, excess inventory that you carry to satisfy demand that exceeds anything that you have forecasted. So uh, like I said, with, with uh, cycle inventory, you forecast a demand using that demand, you calculate how much inventory you need to have uh, cycling through your system, right? But you also know that there is uncertainty in demand and that uncertainty, when that uncertainty comes into play, you have to have some excess inventory to manage that. And that's that's where, that's safety inventory. And that's the role of safety inventory, right? Now, raising the level of safety inventory increases product availability and thus the margin uh, captured from customer purchases. But it also increases inventory holding costs. And that's the uh, trade-off that I was talking about before. So uh, here is a nice picture that sort of explains the role of safety inventory. So this portion that you see here, this is exactly what you have with cycle inventory. So if you assume that there is absolutely no uncertainty in demand, that we know exactly how our demand is going to be for the next, say, year, then we can just manage with cycle inventory. You order a certain item, so you calculate the EOQ formula, you order a certain number of items, you use these items up uh, in, um, uh, in a constant uh, in a constant rate and then as soon as the inventory hits zero your next order arrives inventory goes back up to queue and the the cycle continues so that's one of the reasons why this inventory is called cycle uh, inventory so uh, but 
when you have safety inventory this is a buffer that you have on top of cycle inventory because real life is messy and demand is never so clean right so sometimes demand might be much higher sometimes demand might be lower so you have extra uh, left over but either way you want to have some cushion and that cushion is safety inventory right so the three key questions that you have to uh, answer to understand the role of uh, safety inventory one is what is the appropriate level of product availability so how much product do we want to have uh, what percentage of the time do we want to have our product available and by setting that we will set the amount of safety inventory that we have so how much safety inventory is needed for uh, for that desired level of product availability and what actions can we take to reduce the safety inventory without hurting uh, product availability so these are the three big questions right and we will answer uh, all of these three uh, questions going through this module now, so uh, level of safety inventory is determined by two factors. Uh, one is uncertainty itself. So uncertainty can be in either demand or in supply, but uncertainty is one of the factors that determines the level of safety inventory. The other is obviously the desired level of product availability. And there are other multiple ways of measuring product availability also. So how do you measure demand uncertainty? Now, Demand uncertainty, so like I said, with, when we were talking about cycle inventories, we assumed that capital D was the demand per period. But now we will say that capital D is the average demand per period. So the uh, instead of saying um, the demand was 12,000 a month, we'll say that the average demand was 12,000 a month, right? So we're all we're not only just going to look at the average, we're also going to look at the standard deviation of demand per period. So standard deviation will measure the variation in our demand. So it's based off of the forecast error, but that's the way we're going to measure uncertainty in demand. So we'll have capital D, which is the average demand per period, uh, sigma D, which is the standard deviation of demand per period. Now, this period could be annual or monthly or weekly or whatever number we want, but usually it won't be annual. Uh, we will not look at it directly as annual because we'll also look at something called lead time. So lead time is the gap between when an order is placed and when an order is received. So lead time, so a be, the best example of lead time is, let's say you go on Amazon and you order something. Usually if it is sold by somebody that is not Amazon and that is not part of the Amazon Prime uh, family, then it might take anywhere from three to five days, sometimes even five to seven days. So once you place an order, there's a fixed amount of time before the order arrives, and that's the lead time. Now lead time can be fixed like say for example you order amazon order from amazon you have amazon prime it will arrive for you within two days you know it's exactly it's going to take exactly two days and you get it within two days sometimes even the same day if you live in a metropolitan big metropolitan area like new york or philadelphia then you can get same day delivery but that will be fixed you will know when you place the order when you're going to receive the order so lead time can be fixed or lead time can be variable where you say okay it takes five to seven days Nowadays, if you are, I mean, given everything that happened with the pandemic, if you are ordering furniture, let's say custom furniture, you want you want a couch, but you want a different one, say a different upholstery than the one that they have in the showroom, then nowadays it's taking anywhere from three to say eight weeks, right? So lead time can be very large. So sometimes imagine uh, a company like Macy's ordering uh, clothes, say from manufacturers in China and those lead times can be in months like multiple months so it can be three months four months six months even right so lead times can be very small anywhere from two two days to a day even few hours all the way up to multiple year multiple months right so that's so that's lead time so initially we will assume that lead time is a fixed number we know exactly what lead time is so uh, I will break up this week's um, material into three videos and in the last video we'll look at what happens when lead time itself is uh, variable right so uncertainty in lead time also leads to uh, uncertainty in well, everything so we'll, we'll look at that later on right now because uh, we have lead time so the other thing to know about lead time is that you could say that lead time is also peril time so by peril i mean that that is the time when you will potentially run out of inventory so think of uh, our uh, 
uh, think of our EOQ problem that we did last week. So you you know what your annual demand is, you know what the ordering cost is, holding cost is, and all of that. You calculate um, uh, the you calculate the uh, optimal order quantity, and you know slowly using that, and you know that f once you place an order, there'll be a certain amount of time between before you receive the order. So you notice your inventory; it is going down, it is going down at a certain point in time. You realize, okay, I better place an order because I'm coming close to running out of inventory. You place the order, and once once your order is triggered, it's going to take some time for that order to arrive, and that's the lead time. And during the lead time, you that's when you can potentially run out of inventory. Before you hit lead time, you're not going to run out of inventory because you have enough confidence that you have enough inventory on hand. So lead time is the time when you can potentially run out of inventory. So the demand that you face during lead time is a very important uh, calculation that we do, a very important thing that we track, right? So because lead time is L, an average demand per period is D, standard deviation is sigma D, we can evaluate demand over all of those L periods. So for all the L periods, demand is just, the average demand is just the sum of all the demand. And standard deviation of demand is a pretty complex value. So you have standard deviations for each of the individual periods, but you also have um, a correlation between demand. So if demand is high today, uh, demand could potentially be high the next day because it was high today. Now that happens a lot. So let's say that if, uh, if there's a showroom and suddenly there's a very long line, before that people might think, hey, something very nice is being sold there. And so high demand today might trigger high demand next day. Or it could be Saturday and Sunday, right? So there could be some uh, relationship between demand. So in most of the cases that we assume, we will not assume that there is any correlation in demand. But that's, again, something that we will tackle later, either next week or the, uh, yeah, uh, either next week or the week after we'll tackle it, what happens when you have that correlation between demands. But in most cases, we'll assume that demand is not correlated. And we will also assume that demand for all of those L periods, the variation in demand is similar. So if you're looking at weekly demand and say that the average demand for per week is five and standard deviation of demand is, is uh, let's say average demand per week is uh, say 50 uh, say 50 t-shirts and standard deviation of demand that you sell per uh, standard deviation of demand at your store is let's say five t-shirts. So the average demand is 50, standard deviation is five we will assume that the same average and standard deviation apply for your whole lead time. So if your lead time is five days, once you place an order, your supplier is going to send you t-shirts in five days, let's say. Then each of those days, the average and the standard deviation are going to be the same. And that's not a bad assumption to make, right? Because you, in, instead of looking at it as a whole week, you're just dividing it up into five pieces, and then you're just going to divide the whole thing up into five pieces. So. Given that we're going to make a, the assumption that all the DIs are the same and all the sigma i's, all the standard deviations are the same and there is no correlation, these formulas boil down to these two formulas. So the demand during lead time will be just the average demand times the lead time, right? So it's D plus D plus D plus D L times, so it's L times D. And then standard deviation will be square root of L times the demand, uh, standard deviation of demand during lead time. Uh, sorry, standard deviation of um, periodic demand, right? And of course, there's coefficient of variation, which is sigma over mu. We don't have to worry about that. But th these are the formulas that we're going to use when we say that demand, the lead time is fixed, but demand is variable. So, now, so that's how we are going to uh, look at, if you remember, there were two important things that we need to keep track of, which was uncertainty, right? It's two, uh, we have uncertainty in demand. So we talked about uncertainty in demand. The other thing that we need to talk about is the desired level of product availability, right? Now, we have not talked about uncertainty in supply. We have not talked about uncertainty in the lead time itself, but we have looked at uncertainty in demand. Now, let's look at uh, product availability. So what are the different ways in which you measure product availability? One way is using fill rates. So product fill rates, order fill rates are similar, so we'll just concentrate on product fill rate for the time being. And the other way to look at it is cycle service level, right? The product fill rate says, what fraction of product demand satisfied uh, is satisfied from the product in uh, uh, inventory, right? 
So what is the pro that's the product fill rate. So what fraction of product demand is satisfied from product in inventory and cycle service level. So there are two ways of measuring a similar thing. One is you're looking, looking at it as fraction of uh, demand that is satisfied by product in inventory. The other thing, the other uh, thing that you're looking at is what fraction of replenishment cycles uh, do we end with all customer demand being met? So we say that. So um, we we place so we place an order for our next uh, next batch. So we are within lead time. Were we able to satisfy all customer demand in lead time? If we did, that is good. If we did not then so if we if we did we will mark it as a one if we did not we'll mark it as a zero and if we do this over and over again we'll say cycle service level measures what fraction of these replenishment cycles were we able to satisfy customer demand right so these are two different ways of looking at fill rate one is looking at it as a fraction as a percentage of the product that we uh, are able to sell uh, percentage of customer demand that we are able to satisfy the other is of all the replenishment cycles, what is the likelihood that you will be able to satisfy uh, um, customer demand? So next time period, if I know cycle service level is 90%, then I say that I am 90% confident that in the next replenishment cycle, I will be able to satisfy customer demand. So that's, that's that. Where a replenishment cycle is the interval between two successive replenishment or two successive uh, delivery so that that's what I mean by replenishment cycle so, and these replenishment so there are two types of replenishment policies that you see in real life one is a continuous review policy where the inventory is continuously tracked and the order size so uh, optimal order quantity whatever you calculate with the EOQ formula that uh, that is placed whenever your order reaches a reorder point so you set a reorder point for yourself once your inventory reaches the reorder point you uh, you place the order. The other is periodic review where inventory status is checked in a regular periodic interval and order is placed to raise the threshold level. Now these two types of policies are very common in real life and the best example that I can give for these, I think I talked about this even when I did the first EOQ video but the best uh, examples that I can give for each of these is continuous review is like say managing uh, any sort of let's say either easy pass or let's say you have a Starbucks card or some store card where you have money on it and then you continuously use it. So for example, let's take easy pass, right? So the way my easy pass works is uh, if the amount of money that I have, I go through different tolls and whatnot, if the amount of money that I have on my easy pass goes below $10, then a replenishment order of $50 is triggered, right? So the order optimal order quantity Q is $50. And the reorder point, the point where the next order triggers, the reorder point is $10. So reorder point is also a level of inventory at which the next order gets triggered, right? So in continuous review policy, you keep track of inventory continuously. And as soon as you hit the reorder point, the next order is triggered, but the order quantity is fixed. Every time you place an order, you order for Q items. And that's, that's how continuous review happens. Now, periodic review is you, there are, there's a big period of time between two reviews and whenever you review, you look at how much inventory has been used up and you replenish it. So the best example that I can give for periodic review is a vending machine. Let's say there's a vending machine that only sells Pepsis and there are 100 Pepsis inside a vending. Let's say there are 1000 Pepsis inside a vending machine. I don't know exactly how many these holds, but let's say there's a 1000 uh, Pepsis inside a vending machine. People use the uh, Pepsis. Let's say that in one week there were 150 Pepsis sold. Then the a truck driver comes at the end of the week, checks the vending machine, sees how many Pepsis were sold, and re and then adds 150 Pepsis because that's how many were used. Let's say that there was some convention or something the week after, and all thousand Pepsis were sold. Then when the truck driver comes in, he checks the machine, and thousand Pepsis were sold. Uh, he will replace all. Uh, they will replace all all of the Pepsis with. Uh, all of the, uh, the empty machine with 1000 Pepsi. So every time the order, uh, every time an order is placed, the amount that you order is different. So one time it was 150, the other time it was 1000, the other time it was 200, sometimes it might be only 10 or 20, but the order quantity differs, but the time between orders is fixed. 
it will happen periodically. As opposed to in a continuous review policy, with my easy pass example, if for some reason I'm, let's say, taking somebody to a JFK airport and I do that, uh, so I drive to JFK, I come back, I've used up a lot of my money on my tolls. So the reorder is triggered much, much faster than it usually happens when I don't take, say, somebody to JFK, right? So if that's the case, then the time between orders is not fixed, but the order quantity is always going to be the same. And that's the main difference between continuous and periodic review. And in both cases, you need to hold safety uh, inventories, right? So how much safety inventory should you hold? And that, we'll talk about that in the next video. This video has already gone on too long, so I'll, I'll see you all in the next video, right? Take care.